So let's look at the argument by philosopher John Searle. It's called the Ch Chinese room argument. He says, can an agent locked in a room processing questions in Chinese based on a set of syntactic rules be said to understand Chinese? So it's a, it's a thought experiment which John Searle proposes. It's a very famous uh, argument. Just look, look up the Chinese room argument on the web and you will get all these descriptions. So the idea is that supposing uh, you as an English speaking person or whatever Hindi or Tamil speaking person were locked up in a room and you were full of these slips of paper which are these syntactic rules which say if you see this pattern then send out this response. If you see this pattern then send out this response. Okay. You do not know what that thing is about. You, you see some patterns and you have been instructed to ma do match a pattern and send out a response based on that. And you know there is somebody from outside below the door slipping, sending you slips of paper with some patterns. Then you make some other patterns on slips of paper and, and send them back essentially. Hmm? You do not know what what is happening, but it turns out apparently at the end of this is that somebody is asking you questions in Chinese and you are giving them answers in Chinese. So John Searle says and this is his Chinese room experiment, thought experiment says that supposing this were to happen would you say that the person who is answering you knows Chinese <coughs> and he says no because the way that the experiment has been described and he says that therefore but his behavior looks like intelligent behavior because he is giving you all the answers. But is that real intelligence? He says no essentially. But of course, there is a little bit of an operational trap there which is what I have written here. How many rules will an agent need to have for the thought experiment to be convincing essentially? And we will see this idea again in a different form as we go along. Okay, one more objection from the celebrated mathematical physicist John Roger Penrose. You must have heard about him also a Nobel laureate. He wrote this book which became quite a hit essentially. It was called The Emperor's New Mind essentially. Hmm? Let me write the name here. So, parodying the emperor's new clothes and he, he is also asking this question about can, can one be, can machines think or not. His answer is that no machines cannot think, we are the only thinking creatures and he says that there is something happening in our brains which current day physics cannot understand, cannot explain essentially and that is something he says is with respect to quantum mechanical. If you want to go into those details, you should look up the web or read his book essentially, which is not so easy to read. But still, he wrote a later book, I forget its name, name, which is a shorter version of this book. So, that is another argument. Then there are arguments like he mentioned emotion, intuition, consciousness, ethics. So, some people say it would not be ethical to have intelligent machines, so they cannot be so they cannot be intelligent. Now this is this is kind of a roundabout argument which says it would be bad for by bad for I don't know who. Uh, so we cannot have an intelligent machines essentially. Of course we we are very ethical people, and we go around suspending twenty eight year old IAS officers because of some small prejudice that we have against them. So, there are many arguments which, which occurred in nature and there have been many counters to the argument which I have not talked about because we want to get on uh, to what Turing said. Right? So, you all know Alan Turing, he was very instrumental in cracking codes during world war this thing. What he says that he would have been 101 years old if he were alive today. Okay. What he says 
last year was his fourth centenary and lot of things were going on he says that the question whether machines can think is just a meaningless question because we are not able to even describe we, we made an attempt here to say what is thinking but it's not very clear to say what is thinking i mean iq tests and things like that are of course meaningless essentially as is i guess ge and sat and something what he did was that let's not get into this raging debate of can a machine think or not he says i'll give you a test which he called as the imitation game which you will see in the next slide which is now known as the turing test it has nothing to do with turing machines of this he says about this turing test we will see in a moment or let's first see the test and then come back the turing test is like this that there is a human judge no this something has happened to this anyway there is a human judge sitting on in those is a teletype in current day world maybe on a mobile phone chatting with someone so you are chatting with someone you type in something and somebody else types back something and so on and so forth so he imagined the teletype connected to a machine on the other side but there is a wall in between so you don't know whether it's a machine or whether it's a human being and what turing said was that if he gave a figure like 70% of the time the machine can fool the judge into thinking that the judge is talking to a human being then the machine is intelligent actually so we'll come back to the, to the test again uh so what what did turing feel he felt and this was in 1950 when he wrote this paper called uh, computing machinery and intelligence and it's available on the web if you go to many places you will just get the paper directly he says that in about 50 years of time which is 2000 in year 2000 it will be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of 10 raised to 9 so 10 raised to 9 was considered to be a big number and uh, history is replete with these kind of examples right bill gates apparently had once said that who on earth will need them? memory more than 64k essentially so he said that with a capacity of 10 to 9 to make them play the imitation game the game that we just described so well that an average interrogator will not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification after 5 minutes of questioning and then he says that i believe that at the end of the century which is at the end of 50 years use of words and general ed- educated opinion will be altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted essentially hmm. it's very difficult to make predictions in these kind of matters david levy said that he, no machine can beat him alan turing says that all machine the machines will routinely pass the turing test both were wrong in, in the sense that we still can't say that you know we have machines which pass the turing test so currently there is something called a lobner prize which has been instituted by Gaikal Lobner as the name suggests it's an annual competition where chatbots are judged by for human like response so it's not as if you are fooling something but for human like response and there's a grand prize of 100000 dollars in case you are interested in some pocket money but it's in it's still open essentially so there are two so there's a question which i want to ask of you we we don't have too much time we'll have to stop soon uh, and we'll start with, uh, with this in the next class is to what do you think of the turing test as a test of intelligence remember though he himself said that don't talk about thinking and all but just accept this test let me just show you some examples of uh, this year's competition which i got from the web so this year there are four finalists who are going to compete on september 14 these finalists have been selected based on some earlier rounds and this is a transcript from the leader of those four the best known so 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 let me just read it out so there is a judge and there is this program called aizar so the judge says hello i am ronan that's the name of the judge what is your name and the program responds and just try to imagine how would you write a program which would respond like this this is this is the output of this program which is called aizar it says ronan 
it's about time you contacted me. I was waiting for you. My name is Izar, pronounced Izar, but you can call me Easy if you want. Doing anything fun, too much recursion in AIML, and so on and so forth. Hmm? Judge says at some later point, I have just not, I have not given you the full this thing. I like bananas, which is your favorite food. He says, tell me more about your unknown. Okay. This is a trick which the program is employing to answer a question which is it cannot answer very easily. You are not only one, so you have to build in these kind of tricks. Human beings also do that. If you are taking a viva about something, <laughs> you know, you have seen it. So. I do not have a problem with bananas. Is that your favorite food, the obvious one? And so on. And then he says, I have been getting into Humi, a type of Mongolian throat singing. So, you have to put in certain amounts of knowledge in your system to be able to convince the listener. Okay, so, he, he is trying to impress the yeah, other way. So, let me leave you with a program which was written in 1960 or something. This program is called Eliza. You must might have heard about it. It was named after Eliza Doolittle, who was a character in Bernard Shaw's play called Pygmalion, and we will we will visit Pygmalion again later. It was a very simple lang NLP program written at MIT by Weizenbaum in 1966. It used simple rules to manipulate language. It it would read what the user has written, manipulate it little bit, and throw it back. So it says if you go and say, for example, the, somebody will say, uh, so for example, if you were to say, oh, I like bananas. It would simply say, why do you like bananas? So, it just twist that and send it back to you. And there is a popular version called doctor, which I am sure you might have seen. Uh, it runs a script which makes it looks like a psychotherapist essentially, which of course makes it easy to ask questions. So, it can always, one of the standard questions these programs ask is, tell me more about your family. You know, if they cannot say anything else, they will say, tell me more about your family. And as a human being, you would say, oh, this program is doing some deep analysis. <laughs> So, here is a Russian scientist who was visiting Stanford, who was running a version of this. So, just read this. So, I have colored those things to show you that you know it is just twisting that sentence and this thing. So, these are this is. So, there was a scientist apparently after this conversation, he started pouring out all his woes to this program and so on and so forth. And Weizenbaum found that his secretary was all the time talking to this program and apparently she was uh, quite furious when she found out that Weizenbaum had access to those conversations. <laughs> so, so. But nowadays, of course, you know prism and everything. Weizenbaum actually found that people's responses were so disturbing that he wrote a book which says that no, no, computers cannot do all these kind of things essentially. <laughs> so, we are gullible and I think we will take it up in the next class uh, with some even older examples of how we look at something and we believe that it is doing something in the intelligent for us essentially. Hmm? Meanwhile, I would like you to think about this Turing test in the next class. On Wednesday, we will start discussing what we think about the Turing test essentially.